everyone, students, educators, and members of World Affairs Councils of America across the country. We're delighted to present this second edition of Academic World Quest Countdown Week. We're bringing you uh, a special and distinguished panel on our country in focus for this year's Academic World Quest, and that country is Uzbekistan. I'm Bill Clifford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Councils of America in Washington, DC. And I'm going to be introducing to you shortly Akror Burkhanov, who is the second, sec second secretary at the Embassy of Uzbekistan in, here in Washington. And he also serves as the cultural and tourism attache at the embassy, responsible for those subjects, as well as for media, education, and public relations. And also my friend Elena Son, who is executive director of the American Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce, also here in DC, to discuss more of the economic and co uh, commercial side of what's going on in our bilateral relationship. Now, I want to remind folks that there is an academic world quest bingo opportunity in each of the sessions we present Monday through Friday. So please pay attention to what we learn and Note that this, uh, this session is being recorded. We will also have an opportunity for you to ask questions of the panel. Um, you can do so via um, the chat box function on our Zoom. And we look forward to hearing from you and, and your, your, your areas of interest. So without further ado, I just wanna say that many of the students who have been Pursuing studies on uh, Uzbekistan and nine other topics know that we are talking about a landlocked country in Central Asia that became independent with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. And because it has the largest population in the region and the only country there that borders all four other Central Asian states, and you should know who, what, what they are, um, Uzbekistan is, is really poised for regional leadership. And for this reason, US policymakers have identified Uzbekistan as a key partner in addressing a number of regional issues of which I'm sure uh, Second Secretary Burkhanov will be able to share with us. Um, and so in addition, because of reforms going under, uh, that are underway in the country, there are new opportunities for US engagement and US companies to be active across a range of sectors. And we'll be hearing about that from Ms. Elena Song. So it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Akror Burkhanov, who, as I said, is the cultural and tourism attache at the embassy here in Washington. And he arrived in 2018, but has been with the embassy since, well, 2012. I'm sorry, been with the foreign ministry since 2012. And uh, this is after he graduated with a bachelor's degree in economics at Westminster International University in Tashkent. He's also, uh, a couple of years ago, was an assistant lecturer at his alma mater. Um, having served at the foreign ministry for a number of years since 2012, he's also worked at, I think, uh, a, what appears to be a think tank as a chief research fellow at the Center for International Relations Study, Studies under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And be, just before coming to uh, Washington at the embassy. He was deputy head of the Department for Management and Research and Implementation of Innovations at the Ministry of Innovative Development of Uzbekistan, which is a country that's really on the move. So, Akror, welcome. I'd love to hear about your outlook um, in two ways. One, um, you know, generally, where is Uzbekistan uh, pointed to in its relationship with the United States, but we might start specifically with your area of cultural and tourism, which has to be a difficult challenge uh, in a time of COVID. Thank you very much, Mr. Clifford, for your kind introduction. And it's my honor and privilege today to be with you and with the audience to represent my country, Uzbekistan, and to tell a little bit about my country, the developments that we have been facing over recent years, and also to answer any of the questions that uh, people would like to have. To start with, uh, as uh, you have rightly mentioned, it's a, a new phase of uh, Uzbek-American relations uh, we have been experiencing. Uh, we have never seen such a momentum and dynamics in the relations between our countries. Uh, we testament is that uh, 
uh, over the years, uh, over the last four and five years, we have uh, been able to double the bilateral trade turnover, increase the investments uh, more than twofold, and also uh, increase the American companies working in Uzbekistan. Now we have very dynamic relations. We have uh, last year in uh, November, we were able to upgrade so-called annual bilateral consultations between two foreign ministers like State Department here in the US and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Uzbekistan to a new higher format of dialogue, which is called strategic partnership dialogue. So in, inaugural session is to be held uh, this year in, in Tashkent. Um, Coming to, coming to questions regarding the, how we are dealing about the, like people-to-people -people ties and more on uh, cultural ties with uh, our countries. I should say that uh, Uzbekistan is uh, one of the countries uh, going very deep in history, establish uh, direct people-to-people -people ties. One of the, uh, or one of the uh, vivid testaments is that in 1973, we have established first sister city ties between capital of Uzbekistan, Tashkent, and Seattle in Washington. Actually, it was the first sister city ties between then USSR and uh, United States. And uh, in two years, we are going to celebrate uh, its uh, 50th anniversary. Uh, moreover, we have also established two more sister cities ties uh, with uh, with ancient city called Bukhara in Uzbekistan and Santa Fe in New Mexico. Every year we bring uh, almost 20 uh, handcrafters from Uzbekistan to represent their, uh, uh, their goods and their like, handmade art artworks in Santa Fe in International Fork Art Festival. And uh, one, one, one very interesting thing when I discovered when I first arrived here was that uh, our delegation from Uzbekistan was one of the most popular, selling almost half of the uh, revenues uh, during the IFAM, making, generating almost half a million in in couple days, uh, selling their uh, products in Uzbekistan. And uh, we were continuing our uh, relations with different U.S. states. And two years ago, we were able to establish direct relations between. Uh, Zarafshan city in Uzbekistan with Clinton in um, uh, uh, in, uh, in 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 a US uh, in in US uh, par partner state for Uzbekistan called Mississippi. Great. Well, I'm pleased to say that the World Affairs Councils has two affiliates, um, very strong ones in Seattle and Santa Fe. And although we are not in Mississippi, perhaps we can work together to develop some interest so that we can start a council there, perhaps featuring you. But I, um, since you mentioned the anniversary in Seattle, I wanna uh, highly recommend um, that your ambassador and other officials like yourself will travel there and engage with our councils in Seattle and Santa Fe. Um, I'd love to know also more about uh, how relations with the United States have improved, particularly since uh, 2016, which I think has a lot to do with uh, President Mirziyoyev's uh, liberalization reforms and other efforts to, to really take the country in a new direction. Thank you for your uh, question, very, very good uh, question. Um, as you have rightly uh, mentioned, uh, after the election of uh, uh, President Mirziyoyev to his current post, uh, Uzbekistan started uh, very um, great reforms in, directed into the uh, regional good neighborliness policy, opening up the borders, uh, resolving the uh, I mean, many years uh, issues, uh, mainly connected with uh, border uh, pr problems, and also uh, openness to uh, to globe uh, establishment of uh, direct relations with our partners. And uh, if we continued from the beginning, the very good uh, neighborliness policy between our countries in order to uh, show that Central Asia 
is a one region, one country, which is very, which would be very, I would say, attractive to global partners, global powers like U.S. to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, we have also directly reached to uh, countries like the U.S. in order to enhance the existing partnership and also to observe the areas that we can uh, utilize uh, benefit for uh, both countries. And uh, since 2016, our president has met uh, several times then President uh, uh, Mr. Trump uh, in, in 2018, uh, our president paid an official state visit to United States and to DC, uh, during which we were able to uh, to sign uh, contracts agreements uh, uh, like totaling almost five billion, which is uh, which was unprecedented, and also uh, I would say that the one of the core ingredients of the current state of very high dynamics of Uzbek American relations uh, is I would say mainly the concentration of the reforms back in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan started transforming uh, all areas without an exception. Let it be business, economics, human rights, uh, trans uh, transparency, media freedom, or, re or religious freedom. So it we paid a huge attention to radically transform the society in order to make it attractive, to make it open, transparent. And we eliminated a number of restrictions that hindered Uzbekistan to partner with uh, US and other countries. Uh, we also opened up our borders. We now currently made uh, almost uh, 90 countries visa free to come to Uzbekistan. Mm. Uh, but not still, not US. We hope uh, we'll, US will be on the list uh, soon. But we have made uh, visa free region for most of the. Uh, uh, North American countries, uh, South American countries, and it's on reciprocal basis with the United States. And I, I should say that all, since the visit of uh, our president uh, in 2018, we have had several big delegations exchanging uh, mm -hmm. our delegations led by uh, Deputy Prime Ministers, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, visited DC several times in order to continue the engagements and agreements that we have had with US government. And also we hosted uh, several very high level delegations in Uzbekistan. It was like uh, uh, defense secretary, it was uh, uh, DFC leadership, it was uh, uh, state department leadership and several on the, uh, other levels. And we have also-, also Have you also had engagement with mayors uh, of, of big cities as well? Is there that level of our uh, local government? Thank you. It's a very good question. For the first time, uh, we were able to bring a U.S. governor, I would say, um, U.S. governor from Mississippi to Uzbekistan with the trade mission, with the Mississippi's trade mission to, to our country in 2018. And it was also in 2019, sorry, it was also one of the first, uh, it was one of the first governors visiting our, our country. Very good. Well, when we talk of trade missions, I think of Elena Song. So this would be a good time to bring her into the conversation. Thank you very much, Akrora. Um, Elena Song, ladies and gentlemen, serves not only as the executive director of the American Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce, she also heads the U.S. Kyrgyzstan Business Council, the U.S. Tajikistan Business Council, and the U.S. Afghanistan Business Initiative. She concentrates on promoting stronger high-level dialogue uh, between large U.S. corporations and governments of the U.S. and in Central Asia, as well as financial, international financial institutions on trade, investment, market access, and so on. I hope I'm not giving it away, Elena. She has been with the chamber since uh, July 2011, and I should say she had previous service in Tashkent for the British Embassy. She may talk about that. I just want to mention also that within Washington, D.C., in her copious free time, which I can't imagine she has so much of given how well she has grown her organization, she's the rebranding ambassador for the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center in Washington, and she also serves on the Mayor's Commission on National and Community Service, which is a real honor. And I know that uh, other boards are 
really keen to have her and have enjoyed her, her service. So Elena, welcome. Thanks for setting this panel up. And I really want to start by just asking you, you know, how did you come to the role that you're in? How did you network your way here? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Bill and Laura uh, and uh, all participants for hosting me today. Uh, there is a story behind that, right? And so we all like stories. Uh, so back in the days, I knew one of the former U.S. ambassadors who actually used to serve in one of our um, European countries, so one of the strongest allies of the United States. And so he went to one of the receptions where he met my uh, current chairman, uh, Carolyn Lamb. And so he mentioned about the vacancy and, uh, oh, she mentioned about the vacancy to him. And so he said, well, actually I do know someone uh, who might be good for, for this position. So I went and I met with the board of directors. We had a great discussion. And the result of this discussion, I actually, I was privileged and honored to get this job. So I think that the story is about who you know and to be in the right place at the right time. And if you want to end up in the career of uh, foreign relations, uh, international business development, having these connections do help. Um, I think most importantly is you need to have the skills, you need to have the knowledge and you need to be an expert, a unique expert on a particular issue that will be of value to any company. And then of course, having a strong network and having connections and knowing people um, are also very helpful to kind of to advance your career, especially uh, since you all have aspirations to be, uh, maybe, I don't know, to be in the leadership position eventually, whether it's in the politics, whether it's international business, etc. So I had these aspirations like most of you, and I think that uh, I was just, uh, I was uh, honored and blessed to, to know someone and also to, to offer some of the skills that, uh, that uh, my organization was actually looking for. And so I think that before I proceed further, I'd like to share maybe just uh, two slides. Um, and it's a mm. webinar, so it's very difficult for me to interact with the audience without seeing your faces, but I'm just going to throw the, the question and uh, if you want to answer and put the answers in the chat, uh, in the chat box, please do so. Um, but let me first share my screen. Um, so bear with me, please. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I just want you to look at this screen and um, put in the chat box uh, maybe five companies that you recognize uh, from this uh, uh, from this from this from this board. This is like a billboard, let's say. Uh, and again, if you, and you have only 20 seconds and the time starts now. So if you can just put in the chat box, at least five companies that you, uh, that you recognize. So time starts now. And this is not part, by the way, this is not part of the academic quiz <laughs> that Bill mentioned earlier. Um, this is just to keep this uh, conversation going and to see how well, you know, the, uh, how, know, how well, you know, American brands. So, okay, you only have three seconds left. Don't be shy, uh, people. Please don't be shy, people. Yes, exactly. Companies so, okay. that you see. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So, um, we're done? Okay. Well, um, I'm going to check these questions. But then the other question is, so why do you think we have all these logos on, on the screen? Is there any particular reason? And if you can just put your uh, answers again in the chat box, that would be great. Is there one common denominator that, um, that puts all these companies uh, on, this, uh, on this billboard? Um, throw in any answer that you may think of. That's again, that's a, a brain stimulation here. So, and again, I'm going just to look at this. And um, my next slide is this top logo, which is the American Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce. This is the reason, this is the glue that unites all companies. And that's the reason why all companies are, are here today. So uh, today I represent um, the American Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce, like Bill mentioned. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm just going back to, let's see, can I go back? Um, okay, so. And just, those uh, companies are some of the biggest. Exactly, yes. not it, the biggest. The, if not the biggest, exactly. So um, I represent the American Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce and you will be surprised that we are the 
oldest trade association in Washington, D.C., among the former Soviet Union countries. And so if you know the history, you know that there were 15 countries, 15 republics, and now we have uh, 15 independent countries, including Uzbekistan. And so in 1993, again, there is a, there is a story. There is a fascinating story behind the creation of this chamber. Um, so we were created uh, by a group of three companies. And today we are the third largest trade association in Washington, DC, and as well as Central Asia, in the, again, and in the former Soviet Union space. Um, if you ask me who are the, the other two, the other two are obviously the two largest countries uh, in that space, and that's Russia and Ukraine. So we are the third largest among, again, Central and Eastern Europe, and um, as well as the uh, CIS countries. So why are we here? Well, the reason is Uzbekistan. We're here to represent American business and to generate economic and business opportunities for American public and for people in Uzbekistan. And we stay true to our mission, which is again, um, providing opportunity, providing better healthcare, providing better education, uh, better, practices, managerial practices uh, to the people of, uh, of Uzbekistan. And Bill mentioned about my experience of working for UK and for, uh, and I worked in the private sector for quite some time. I can tell you that having traveled abroad, I can, I can assure you that there is no country in the world that can offer as much as the United States. I think that we are the best when it comes to offering innovation, creativity, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, but we are also the best when it comes to managerial skills. There is a great degree of uh, respect for individual rights, for, and when it comes to business, that's very important because I'm talking about the copyright issues and trademarks and, and stuff like that. Um, and that is something that we do offer to the Republic of Uzbekistan. And all of our companies, again, we represent the billboard, we represent Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies in Uzbekistan. And it's fascinating because not everybody kind of like uh, realized that, that all these companies are in Uzbekistan because this is the place to do business. And we've been doing business uh, there since 1993. Uh, we've had very strong relations with the government of Uzbekistan uh, in a variety of sectors, including aviation, where we have Boeing, where uh, Air Energy, Honeywell, General Electric, uh, in the tourism industry, we have uh, Coca-Cola. In the financial sector, we represent Visa. In the legal sector, we represent White and Keys, Big McKinsey, and so many others. So it's again, we privileged to to uh, to to be in Uzbekistan. And if I may, just talk about a little bit of the history as to why we were created. So back in the days in 1993, Uzbek ambassador to Shabai uh, had a group, had a lunch with a group of uh, American business people. And the embassy was just there at the very, at the very kind of like first steps of its creation. And they were trying to find and navigate the, the DC landscape. And mm -hmm. as you know, in DC, it's who you know, how you know, and whether or not you understand the system. And so his question was like, what's the, what's the recipe for success in DC? Do you need to have money or do you need to have friends? And the response from our business was, that's very easy. You just need to have friends. And that's how the chamber was created. So uh, Friends of Uzbekistan on the business side decided to create the Chamber of Commerce. And again, ever since then, we've been honored to represent uh, these great American brands and work with the government of Uzbekistan on advancing um, American commercial interests and strengthening opportunities. And cre again, creating opportunities here in the United States, like Boeing sells Dreamliners, and uh, it creates a lot of opportunities, job opportunities here in the United States, as well as in Uzbekistan. So. I think that I just uh, put a potpourri, a mix of different stories, uh, but I hope that uh, that's our, it's a good kind of like, our, it's a good uh, review of who we are, why we're here and who we represent. It's a very helpful introduction and thank you very much, Elena. Um, I have a question that I, I seem to hear asked of, of everyone and I, I'm always curious because given the uh, rise of China and the competition and the rivalry that China represents for the United States. Um, we hear a lot about the New Silk Road and the China Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Um, that seems to run right through Central Asia, among other places. There's also the Sea uh, Maritime uh, Silk Road. But could you talk about could you talk about um, the effect that that is having? on the engagement with Uzbekistan and, and China and to what extent it is um, a challenge for US companies or a spur for them to 
get in there more. And I want to also invite uh, Akor into that conversation too. But Elena, are you able to speak to the uh, uh, China? Oh, okay. Yeah. For for some reason, I thought this was a question for Akro because I thought no, no, great no, you first <laughs> because there is an economic, <laughs> yeah, but we will so, hear from the embassy too. <laughs> sure, um, I think it's a it's a, it's a good question and it's the one that draws a lot of attention and it draws a lot of attention, I think, from geopolitical side and uh, I maybe just from our perspective, I mean, with all our respect, China is a great market in the sense of the of their of the scale and in the scale of uh, in in terms of the opportunities that the Chinese market provides, and of course, I mean, its geopolitical location is critical to Uzbekistan and to other uh, other countries in the region. It it has historical ties uh, to the region, and it also has business ties. A lot of our companies uh, that we represent in Uzbekistan have uh, have business uh, operations in the Chinese market. I think we. Um, I would like to refer to, you, um, to my previous comment that we are very apolitical, that we as a chamber uh, that represents so many companies, a diversity of companies that are in the manufacturing industry, that are in the exporting industries, uh, in the legal and et cetera. Uh, we, we try to be apolitical and we try to follow the trends that are set by the governments, by the US government, as well as the, um, as the Uzbek government and Central Asian governments in general. Uh, we always try to look after the interests of, uh, of people. We, we, we respect the fact that there is a, a new Silk Road, that there is a, uh, a desire by the Chinese government to, uh, to, to, to expand their, um, their influence, commercial influence or political influence on, on countries in the world. And I think that uh, that's something that we are trying to, to offset by providing the best expertise, the best equipment and the best knowledge uh, to the people of Uzbekistan. Uh, when it comes to business, let's not forget that I think the best part about business in America, especially about American business is competition. We love competition. We, laughed, we, we, we enjoy competing against uh, Europeans, we enjoy competing against uh, Chinese, I mean, Asian countries and, and so many other companies. And the reason why we, pref we, we like competition is that at the end of the day, it's the people of Uzbekistan and people of the United States of America that benefit from that. Because it, it allows companies to compete and again, to offer the best value and uh, the best product to the public and then let the public decide what it is that they want to do. And I'll give the example. I mean, when it comes to kind of like spheres of interest and of, of influence and how we compete uh, in different industries. I mean, of course we, we do compete and we do compete strongly. Um, when it comes to the decision about whether to go, uh, let's say with, a, with an American company, with a European company or with the Asian, some people do look at the price. Right, and so they let's look at the iPhone. I mean, if someone wants to buy an iPhone, they look at the pocket, and then, oops, I don't have, let's say, thousand dollars just to 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 put on the table right now. Maybe I'll just take a payment plan, right? Uh, or let's say someone wants to buy Samsung, and they don't have necessarily the cash to to buy. So the first criteria when people look at the competition, and again, that's the U.S. competing against China or some some, some somewhere else for that matter. We always look at the, okay, how much money uh, is it going to cost me? But then the other question that we would like, we do want our counterparts in Uzbekistan and in the other country to look at is at the value that we offer. And again, I would like to emphasize there is nobody, no one is, no one is better than American companies. We offer not only the best product technologically, but also we provide the best the best training, the best technical technical maintenance, the best technical service, and as well as the respect for respect for the uh, for, for the management. And again, I'm I'm repeating myself, but that's just kind of like to say that it's not only about this new Silk Road. It's not only about about the country uh, country or political aspirations. You always have to look in business. I would say there is never black and white. There is never kind of like a very strict, like here's what it is. Uh, we do have members who have uh, operations in, in that market. And I think that whatever we do, we always have to remember that what matters is the commercial uh, American competitiveness, American strength and respect of companies, regardless of where they are. 
for the rules of for the rule rule of law and uh, again individual rights. And so uh, we do watch and we do monitor and review the dialogue between Uzbekistan and uh, their Central Asian counterparts. Uh, China has played a critical role in helping Central Asia to uh, to work on the infrastructure, and uh, we know that they've been involved in the small and medium sized enterprises development sector. And uh, there is now uh, some cooperation going on in terms of the healthcare and providing the vaccines. Um, again, it's uh, it's an open world right now. I think the borders are quite transparent in this sense, and uh, countries do want to use the opportunity. It becomes a very competitive place, and Uzbekistan is a great competitive uh, competitive landscape where. Um, we're, that that stimulates a lot of competition. So I think that what I would say as someone who represents business is that uh, we welcome competition and we want companies and we want countries to be present in Uzbekistan. And uh, again, as long as we all use the same rules and respect uh, for the rules and for the requirements, I think that's something that will eventually benefit um, everybody, um, everyone involved. Very good. We're starting. I'm very pleased to see that questions are coming in from the chat box. And so I'm going to ask this one because it dovetails with what you just said, Elena. And then I have another question for Akror. Um, this is uh, an anonymous question that is, what, are, what other countries besides the US and China are seeking to develop strong ties with Uzbekistan? That could be for either of you. In fact, both of you, if you like. If you allow, let, let me start uh, first. Uh, Uzbekistan, uh, I would say, uh, so I'll, let me put it in, into two ways. First, uh, well, it, is, it is very vital for, our, for Uzbekistan to have the best relations possible with our direct immediate neighbors in Central Asian countries. Why? Because uh, historically, People of Central Asia are like considered part of like one bigger family, and it is very important in order to maintain both trade, economic, political, and people-to-people -people ties to have very good relations with our neighbors, and we are doing so. Uh, we used to have uh, border issues with Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and uh, we have uh, resulted over the last years. We have almost completed all the uh, issues recently. Uh, new, newly elected president of uh, Kyrgyzstan visited Uzbekistan, and they had very productive talks with our president. And they have uh, they have openly announced, stated that within the three months ahead, they will solve this issue uh, totally. Most people among audience may not know such kind of issues because they are living in a in United States or yeah, which doesn't have that kind of very big border issues. But if you know that between countries there are some disputed areas, mm -hmm. it may cause a lot of tensions between countries. Uh, and it may affect not only on day-to-day -day life, but it will affect your political life, the economic life, and, uh, and social situation. So it is very important for neighbors do, uh, not to have any kind of disputed uh, areas or territories between themselves. So it's our first priority. Now, uh, Uzbekistan has very good relations with all Central Asian countries. And nowadays, we are, uh, we are also working very heavily with uh, Afghanistan uh, government and considering it also as a part of uh, Central Asia. And in a second dimension, we are looking forward to partnering with every country in the world that seeks partnership with Uzbekistan. We never choose one country on the cost of other countries. Uh, of course, we are developing uh, good relations with a uh, number of countries in the world and statistics speak themselves. Over the years, we can say that uh, we had uh, developed very good economic relations with countries like uh, Korea, Japan, uh, China, Turkey, uh, Germany, Russia, and other countries. Our biggest trade partner currently is China which is way bigger than what we trade with the United States. So here's a very big task for Yelena to, to increase that uh, trade uh, turnover between our countries and also to engage more on business relations. Second, our second trade partner is uh, Russia. And we have uh, Korea, uh, Kazakhstan, 
Turkey, um, Germany, or in our like uh, top ten countries. Um, in two thousand, in nineteen ninety five, I should say that uh, we brought uh, one of the industries uh, called like automotive industry to build uh, automobiles from Korea to Uzbekistan together with partnering uh, with company called Devo. That times now that company transport to uh, GM Uzbekistan producing the Chevrolet more than ten types of Chevrolet cars in Uzbekistan, and uh, uh, in that uh, case I would say that Uzbekistan is partnering with countries with their specific industries to bring the best possible uh, technologies, knowledge, and expertise to Uzbekistan, and uh, so far. Over the recent uh, couple of years, I should I can boast as a uh, representative of my country that we have brought uh, such companies like Renault, Volkswagen to Uzbekistan to to work with us to build uh, new new industries. We have German is also man to build uh, uh, heavy uh, heavy auto automobiles in, in in Uzbekistan. We are boosting our uh, textile cluster with. Uh, Turkey. We are working heavily on agriculture with uh, some of the European countries. We are bringing uh, chemical industry, to, I mean, high advanced chemical industry to Uzbekistan. So we are partnering with our, uh, like, with different countries on different industries. And for the US, I should say that uh, uh, GM has been uh, very I mean, uh, involved in uh, Uzbekistan. We are producing uh, engines that are exported even till uh, some of the South American countries in the world. So yeah, it's a it's it's a very active dynamic cooperation uh, and with uh, all the like actors in the world. Uzbeks in one word I should say that Uzbekistan is open to anyone who looks to be a good partner with our country. Great and Akrar, um, I should have. Uh, I should have made this wish earlier. Ramadan Karim, I was reminded by a question from, uh, I believe it was Marcy Pitkin, you know, what is, what are the major religions in your country? Could you talk about uh, uh, religious faith in Uzbekistan and how that um, perhaps has a positive influence on the country's foreign policy? Um, thank you very much for your congratulations and uh, reminding uh, about Ramadan. Today we started like the first day of this uh, holy month, uh, and as an embassy here, in, we are celebrating it, and also back in our country, uh, Uzbekistan uh, is a country with uh, most. Uh, I mean, the main real religion in Uzbekistan is Islam. More than ninety percent of uh, people worship Islam, but Uzbekistan is a secular country which means religion is separate from the government. So government is not integrated or like doesn't uh, join combined with religion. They are like two separate institutions. Government is independent from uh, any religions in the country with uh, executing its, its power and its affairs. Uh, and I, I should say that historically Uzbekistan was uh, I would say center of uh, Islamic civilizations. Um, yeah, yeah. We have the uh, greatest scholars uh, like Al Biruni, uh, Al Bukhari, uh, that resided lived in Uzbekistan. We we have the uh, thousand years old uh, city called Bukhara, which became home for scholars from across the world, I mean, Islamic religious scholars coming to our country and coming to Bukhara to do their research. Uh, it was a home for knowledge. And many people in, in many Islamic countries, they admitted. And uh, the religion in Uzbekistan is a study heavily. We try to give to the people to make to make them understand the essence of Islam to understand it is uh, uh, it's I would say good deeds and a re re and uh, religion itself and uh, we currently in Uzbekistan have uh, higher education institutions which provide bachelor's degree master's degree PhDs doctoral degrees in Islam and to give 
the uh, knowledge. Uh, currently in Uzbekistan, we have over 2,000 uh, mosques and that are supported by government, by public, and uh, we are paying great attention to uh, to teaching Islam, to uh, nurturing people with, uh, with, I would say, with the main uh, core of the re religion. And uh, for the people who know um, Islam, they know that it doesn't teach any bad deeds. It always teaches to be humble, to do the good deeds, to help people. It never teaches uh, any kind of bad activities that are associated with, uh, some, sometimes that are associated with uh, Islam or with Islamic countries. Thank you very much. Um, Elena, I have a question that came to me directly, which is, what is Uzbekistan's, and, and it's a completely different uh, path, uh, but it's a good question. What is Uzbekistan's main source of energy? Talk about the natural resources and how that may be attractive for U.S. companies to, to partner. And how is climate change affecting the country? Well, I think these are great questions that we can pose. Uh, we can pose to our crew, uh, but yeah. I'll just talk a little bit from from our point of view. I mean, from the core. Again, we're a membership-based organization, so we're here representing companies and we're here representing their views on uh, on the issues. And so, in terms of the energy resources, Uzbekistan is uh, is rich in natural resources, especially in gas. I think there is also neighboring Kazakhstan, which uh, some of you may have heard as well, and uh, they also have. Uh, oil and gas resources, as well as Turkmenistan. So uh, companies that we represent are, like I said, it's uh, GE and Honeywell and Caterpillar, and they provide mm -hmm. uh, equipment uh, for the oil and gas sector. We also uh, represent company that is in the nuclear uh, industry, and that is Chemical, which was formerly known as, as NOCAM. I think that in terms of the traditional sources, we, of course, we applaud the government uh, of Uzbekistan's uh, policies that are pretty balanced, very transparent, as well as um, kind of like cognizant of the current developments and as well as respect for the uh, for the expertise that American companies can offer. Uh, we do know that this industry is, some, is, is one of those industries where you see a lot of competition. So you see companies uh, from Russia, from uh, from China, South Korea, as, as well as some European countries that are that are present there. So um, Again, the companies that we represent are in that in this in that traditional particular uh, sphere. Um, climate change, is, of course, is of concern to to our companies. We all uh, monitor and review and follow the um, the trends that are set here by the executive and legislative branch of the mm -hmm. United States government. And of course, we we do support the agenda and we do support. We're trying to kind of like to look after after the U.S. interests here. And of course, it does affect the equipment that we use. It does affect also financing, for instance. We just recently, we had a, a discussion with one of the financial uh, institutions on um, on fossil fuels and how it's going to affect uh, our company's position and et cetera. So uh, it, it's it's one area we certainly want to uh, to support the uh, the global effort. And um, at the same time, we want to be cognizant so that we can adapt and uh, adapt and I think adjust uh, adjust to the new to the new processes and to the new requirements. But again, I think that uh, there is one beauty with American business is that we not only follow but we also lead by example. And so uh, that's something that climate change and the, and respect for the preservation of our environmental kind of like uh, landscape for the future generation is something that is the forefront of American companies. So again, uh, we've been working with the government of Uzbekistan as well as the United States government. I mean, outside of this trade association, because mm -hmm. uh, our companies are members of so many other uh, trade associations that represent so many other countries, uh, but they've been working very strongly and very, um, very actively uh, on those issues. Akro, would you like to comment on the same question? Um, yes, if you allow me, let me share a little bit of my uh, screen just to make sure to show the abundance of natural resources. Here uh, in this slide, you can see the uh, main natural resources that uh, Uzbekistan has. We are one of the, uh, I would say, top countries having uh, gold reserves in our country. We have uh, 6,000 tons of reserves, uh, known reserves and production is nine, uh, 90 tons, and it's one of the top uh, top 10 in, in the world. We have, we are also very rich with natural gas. We are 
copper, uranium, silver, coal, and tungsten. Actually, Uzbekistan is uh, uh, Uzbekistan has uh, almost all the elements in Mendeleev's uh, table that are uh, found in our country. And uh, the thing is that um, being rich in natural resources doesn't mean that uh, it's a rich country. And uh, currently, well. I mean, most of the people studying economics and the futures of life, they know they will face a term called resource course. Usually when you have a lot of resources, it might negatively affect your economy because you might become dependent on the resource export, export and things like that. In our country, we are trying to decrease export of resources at any stages and we are working heavily on implementing grant national strategy in order to uh, make the final products, high value added products uh, going out of the Uzbekistan rather than just to sell the resources in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, Uzbekistan was also known as uh, one of the leading cotton producers in the world uh, historically and it was uh, like cotton factory of uh, USSR times. Nowadays, uh, we have yeah, we have been impl implementing uh, restrictions to export cotton uh, as a raw material, and uh, instead we are producing uh, textile fabrics, uh, clothes. We we have been uh, uh, we have been partnering with leading uh, brands uh, in the world in order to supply uh, them the uh, necessary ready-made goods. And it is one of the examples how we are turning uh, our resources that we are rich uh, to a final product that uh, we would like to supply the world as uh, so with high value added. I appreciate your highlighting that point of the transition of the, uh, you know, from, from producing just the cotton and, and moving up the, the curve, if you will, to, to a higher value add in textiles and then to even more technology and uh, uh, more complicated, uh, if you will, uh, sectors. It was interesting last night, our program was with Kevin Cassidy who directs the International Labor Organization's uh, office in the United States. And uh, one of the four countries featured around the world in our, our session was Uzbekistan. And, and he highlighted the progress, uh, particularly in agriculture to industry that uh, your country has made in combating uh, rights issues uh, for child labor and uh, forced labor. And so it was actually a positive story about the, the progress that uh, Uzbekistan has made. And I wonder if, um, you know, sticking with the, 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 the question of your, your labor force, to what extent has COVID uh, held the country back. Of course, it has dampened economic growth around the world, but I'd like to get a sense of what that has meant for uh, the domestic economy um, from you and also what it has meant for trade and investment, which Elena could comment on. So uh, be, I, I can start with uh, COVID one and how it affected to the labor sector in Uzbekistan. Uh, we have, uh, I would say, mm, currently we have uh, COVID cases of 85,000 confirmed in Uzbekistan. We had two lockdowns in our country last year. Uh, in 2019, one of the, I would say, the biggest blooming sectors of Uzbek economy was tourism. Mm. If in 2016 we had uh, about 2 million tourists visiting Uzbekistan, in 2019 we had almost 7 million. So it increased dramatically. And in 2020, we were expecting even more. And many industries in Uzbekistan, many businessmen, uh, men and women were planning to establish new hotels, new resorts, new tourism attractions. And I would say service sector uh, was affected uh, most by COVID because no tourists, both in internal and uh, foreign tourists coming to Uzbekistan. And, uh, because and they had they had a lot of plans. They took uh, loans, uh, leased some equipment, lands, built new uh, facilities, and they needed to pay back their loans uh, back to the banks. 
And it was the main sector, uh, service sector, uh, because of lockdowns, we understood it. Government, uh, government uh, made a separate fund uh, in order to recover some of the costs. And we made like uh, loan vacations for most of the industries that were affected. Um, and I would say for a while, all the sectors, all the sectors which were not considered as not essential uh, have been locked down uh, for like a couple, uh, I would say a couple, a couple weeks to months period, but then we uh, reopened with all uh, precautions. Uh, in general, I would say uh, by World Bank estimates uh, in 2019, if we had a uh, 5.8% GDP increase last year due to COVID, uh, I mean, we had increased uh, of GDP, it was 1.6, uh, but it was much less than 5.8 a year before, but still it is one of the very few countries that had positive GDP dynamics during the pandemic crisis last year. Great. And if I may add to what uh, Akros said, I mean, when the pandemic actually started, uh, we uh, we watched Uzbekistan's government uh, efforts to 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 try to address the issues, business issues, and we really uh, were um, were amazed and impressed by how quickly the government introduced measures to to protect business and to protect consumers and to introduce financial mechanisms to kind of like to soften the economic impact on on businesses. Um, like Akro said, I mean, tourism is one of the sectors that did get affected and uh, it, we continue to see that uh, kind of like a negative effect until today. We do have companies, for instance, and we do, we do know that there are tourists that are ready to jump on the plane, uh, that are ready to travel because they're tired of sitting home like many of us. Um, however, uh, countries of the world are trying to be very cautious and careful because with all the variants, they're trying to protect uh, not only the tourists, but also not only their own population, but also the tourists uh, from, from, the, from the inevitable. You did mention about the ILO. It's, in, it's an interesting mm -hmm. issue because that's something that, again, we were uh, impacted to some extent as well. And we do applaud the government of Uzbekistan's radical change on, uh, uh, on labor issues, on the use of uh, child, child labor as well as forced adult labor in the cotton industry. And so earlier this year, uh, on January 29th, actually, we hosted Deputy Prime Minister Omar Zakov, as well as uh, Jonas Astrup, who is, our, who is a representative of the ILO for a conversation with business about ethical, ethical sourcing, because we know what's going on right now. There is a, a strong push from the consumers on uh, making sure that there is no uh, ill practices used in the collection, in the harvesting of cotton. And so we were delighted to witness and uh, to hear the statement from the ILO about eradication of the systemic use of uh, child labor as well as uh, forced adult labor in, in the cotton industry. And just there a week ago, we hosted our own member, Dan Patterson, and mm -hmm. um, unfortunately it happened uh, just uh, a few days ago, but this was a really fascinating story of how American investor decided to come to Uzbekistan. Again, he had a story where his father-in-law used to uh, used to be involved with Uzbekistan back in the Soviet times. And so then at the invitation of the Uzbek ambassador, the invitation of the Uzbek government, uh, he and his business, his family business decided to come back to Uzbekistan and have our, uh, their own uh, cotton cluster in Jizak region. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great story because uh, he's using innovative uh, technologies as well as American equipment uh, in his cotton field. And it's a, it's a, it's a story not only about the best of, what American companies can offer, but it also a great story about the charitable nature of American business because Dan not only invests in business, he not only is a great businessman, but he's also very charitable. Uh, he's mm -hmm. paying for education of one of his employees. He's playing also for medical treatment of uh, one of the Uzbek nationals. And so uh, when the uh, local dam, uh, there was an issue, a huge issue with the flooding by the local dam, he actually provided again uh, bread and and roof to uh, to many people, to many refugees who were affected. So, again, it's just to show that 
Uh, there is a very strong American business presence. And the reason why companies, why people do like American businesses because they offer so much more. Um, and I'd like to go back to the glo uh, global climate change issues a little bit mm -hmm. as well. This is something that I think for some people, especially for younger generation, this may seem like a, a new a new, a new, new issue as something that has been in the press uh, just lately. But Uzbekistan was largely affected by the global, uh, by the climate change, it's RLC. And RLC, I don't know if we just go to Wikipedia. <laughs> I think that's what we, we normally go to, right? Uh, but that's a, that's a tragedy that Uzbekistan um, mm. was sad to have. But again, with the government of Uzbekistan- Remind we, people who may not know what happened to the RLC. Yeah, so again, that's our centralized policies, right? Because our, it's, our, it's a, I would say, ill practices of water management. And when the Soviet Union kind of like tried to uh, try to force a one monoculture, which was cotton, and cotton mm. is a very water-consuming product. Mm. And so, unfortunately, when you have uh, ineffective water management practices and managerial practices, that's when the the, the disaster happened. And unfortunately, Uzbekistan uh, had this uh, aerial sea issue where it just dried, and so it created uh, air pollution and it created uh, water issues, and so conditions that were not healthy for the local mm. population uh, to be in. And unfortunately, the deterioration was uh, was really bad and it lasted for many uh, for many years. And Akro, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was in 2018 or 2019 when President Mirziyoyev, or maybe 2017 when President Mirziyoyev actually offered, uh, initiated uh, an international coalition efforts uh, to save the RLC. And that's when the United Nations uh, Secretary General got involved and they got the governments of Denmark and other countries to, to go and provide kind of like collective assistance uh, with the government of Japan, I believe as well was, was involved, uh, but to provide collective assistance to Uzbekistan. So again, uh, if you do think that uh, global climate change is a new trend, is a new issue, it's not, and unfortunately Uzbekistan was affected, but this, again, this is, there is a success story. Just look at Uzbekistan and how they managed to to resolve the issue through through better management, through through much stronger and uh, visionary leadership, and it's given a, a great uh, public awareness and consciousness of of those issues, um, not only there but around the world. Uh, it's a good time for me to mention that next week uh, Waka is featuring a five day program called Waka Climate Week, um, and we will have experts uh, from Korea and uh, elsewhere in our own country as well throughout the week and, and hosted by different councils. So please tune in for that. Um, we have, we've gone over, but we technically have three minutes to six o'clock and I want everybody to enjoy their evening and Ramadan uh, celebration. So let's just uh, close with the final big question. You don't have to answer long, but you can maybe put up one or two bullet points for everybody. And this is a big question. What changes in U.S.-Uzbekistan relations can we expect to see with the election of President Biden? Maybe each of you signal one. I, 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 can, with, I can start with one continuity. As Uzbekistan and U.S. relations have turned to become more institutional. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think that I would like to echo that uh, there will be continuation of C5 plus one, uh, the initiative that uh, was started during uh, during President Obama. And I think that's something that Uzbekistan has very strong positions, as well as our peace and security in Afghanistan. Um, again, that's our, one of the neighbors of, uh, of Uzbekistan. And I think that the U.S. has been so much invested in that. Um, and from the, from the business point of view, we do want Uzbekistan to prosper. And the government of Uzbekistan, the president, indicated that one of the strongest reasons why they want American companies to be there is because of our anti strong anti-corruption practices. And again, that's, that's a, one of the top requirements for any business to, to succeed. And so um, C5 plus one, anti-corruption, as well as peace and prosperity uh, in Afghanistan, I think this will be, this will be three topics uh, that we'll see um, under the Biden administration. And so we, again, we applaud, we applaud the engagement and we applaud, there is someone who, who is behind the scenes and, uh, but he's very active actually on social media. It's uh, Uzbek Ambassador Jablon Bahabov. Uh, if you're not on Twitter or if you're not on LinkedIn, please do join and, uh, and follow, follow this fascinating ambassador. He is there, uh, what we call a, a tycoon, uh, someone who, who never sleeps and uh, who is always posting great stories about his country's cooperation with the United States. That's a that's a Wikipedia for you. 
Well, we hope to host the ambassador on uh, another program in the future, but I am delighted with the wealth of information that you've shared in such a short time with us. This hour went quickly. We wish we could have more time with you, uh, but Elena Son and Akror Brokhanov, thank you so much for presenting tonight. I know the students and teachers appreciate it. Others who are not able to join will get our recording through our Academic World Quest Countdown Week communications. We send them out multiple times a day this week and we will have them on our website. I have one last message I'm seeing coming up and that is, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you for joining tonight's program. That came from Laura to everybody. You see our business about, about Climate Week. You'll see more about Academic World Quest. Again, Elena and Akra, thank you so much for being with us this evening. We appreciate the collaboration and look forward to engaging you again with World Affairs Councils, not only in Washington, but also around the country. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank, you, so thank you so much for hosting us and thank you for everyone for, for your time and interest in Uzbekistan and hope you can travel there. Uh, there is a direct flight uh, from New York to Tashkent and it's a Boeing Dreamliner. Very good. Well, let's hope we can all take that soon and it's safe to do so. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.